Around 7% of the world's oceans are covered by sea ice for at least part of each year. The bright surface of the sea ice reflects sunlight back into the atmosphere, which helps regulate climate and restricts heat transfer between ocean and atmosphere. Dr Jordan Pitt researches the interaction between sea ice and ocean waves. The moving water causes the sea ice to develop differently than if it was just still. Bigger waves can break up the sea ice into smaller chunks called flows. Dr Pitt is trying to better understand what happens when water washes over those flows in the Antarctic region. This is where water comes on top of the flows and this can lead to growth or melting depending on the surrounding temperature. His findings will be fed into broader models that help scientists better predict the rate of climate change. Dr Pitt is one of five recipients of the 2022 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Scientist Award, which recognises outstanding students and early and mid-career researchers in the physical and biological sciences. He says he hopes the honour sends a message to Indigenous Australians that they are welcome in the STEM community. That's a sentiment shared by another of this year's recipients, Vanessa Sewell. For the first time, my work is being recognised by my peers, which is important, and I'm also able to represent my Aboriginal mob in science on a national stage. Miss Sewell's research aims to better prevent internal parasites in sheep. The problem costs the Australian livestock sector more than $450 million a year. She's working on ways to create more sustainable and effective vaccines. Good animal health and welfare is really important for Australia's sustainable livestock sector as well as for the farming producers. She plans to use her award grant to travel to Scotland to be part of a prototype vaccine project. Dr Kian Wheeler's passion is using movement to engage children across a range of early development areas. We have what's called movement-based skills, and these are things like running, jumping, throwing, uh, walking in a straight line, and they're paired up with social-emotional learning skills. The programs are co-designed with local communities, ensuring the integration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives. We don't rock up to community and say, hey, we've got this great program that we want you to work with. Instead, we say, hey, we've got this sort of framework that we can work off and we'd like you to design it with us so that we can better prepare community for the impact of childhood development. Dr Wheeler was the first Indigenous Australian to graduate with a PhD from the University of the Sunshine Coast. Now based at the University of Queensland, he says he's proud to play an active role in improving the educational and social outcomes for Indigenous children. Thank you for joining the Australian Academy of Science this evening for a special NAIDOC Week webinar on embracing Indigenous knowledge in STEM. My name is Helene Marsh, and I'm a Vice President of the Australian Academy of Science and the Secretary for Biological Sciences. I live in North Queensland on the country of the Woolgaroo Kabar Bindle people. This event is being live streamed to you from the iconic Shine Dome in Canberra, which was officially reopened last month by the Governor-General and the Minister for Industry and Science. I begin tonight with an acknowledgement of country. The Australian Academy of Science acknowledges and pays respect to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the lands on which the Shine Dome is located. The Academy also acknowledges and pays respect to the traditional owners and the elders past, present and emerging of all the lands on which the Academy operates and its fellows live and work. They hold the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. The 2022 NAIDOC week theme is get up, stand up, show up. It highlights the need for genuine commitment to support and secure institutional, structural, 
collaborative and cooperative reforms for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. To discuss this from a STEM perspective, we're honoured to have our panellists with us tonight. Professor Tom Calmer, Associate Professor Bradley Mogridge, Susan Beetson and Vanessa, Vanessa Sewell. Professor Tom Calmer, a proud Kanarakan and Iwajia man, is the Chancellor of the University of Canberra. Elected to the Academy's Fellowship in May this year, he's the first Academy Fellow who identifies as an Aboriginal person. He's an Indigenous health champion. His work has helped improve Indigenous people's health, education and justice for over 45 years and continues to have an enduring impact on public discourse in Australia and beyond. Associate Professor Mogridge, a proud Camilla Roy man, is a PhD candidate and Associate Professor in Indigenous Water Science. He's also based at the University of Canberra. Brad is an environmental hydrogeologist and was one of the inaugural recipients of the Academy's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Award in 2019. The Academy is grateful to have Bradley offer his expertise and insights as part of our Reconciliation Action Plan Working Group. Susan Beetson is a Nimba, Wayuwan, and Wiradjuri female academic in computer science at the University of Queensland and a PhD candidate at the Queensland University of Technology. Susan's thesis explores the dyadic phenomenon of nodes in culturally different social media networks. Her research embeds Aboriginal people's design of immersive and interactive technologies, specifically within cultural learning contexts, including languages and environmental and ecological communities across our waters, lands and skies. Vanessa Sewell, a proud Wurramai woman, is a PhD candidate in biotechnology, molecular biology, and parasitology at the University of New England. Vanessa was a recipient of the Academy's 2022 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Scientists Award, recognizing her research to address the problem of vaccinating against drench resistant sheep parasites. Welcome to you all. Now I'll hand over to Tom to facilitate this important discussion. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, most appreciated. Uh, and thank you for your introduction. And a big thank you to the Australian Academy of Science for coordinating this evening's event. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands throughout Australia where we're all coming in from um, and, and, uh, and participating. And also acknowledge those on the countries uh, who aren't represented in this, in this um, webinar. Can I also recognise that I'm coming to you from um, the Shine Dome and in Canberra uh, on Ngunnawal country. But uh, as Helene mentioned, I'm, I'm from Darwin, uh, Kungarikan on my mother's side and Iwaja on my father's side. Can I start by unpacking the definition of Indigenous knowledges as there are many definitions and descriptions and all are somewhat inadequate at expressing the nature, diversity and complexities of Indigenous knowledges. UNESCO, for example, states that Indigenous knowledge refers to the understanding, skills and philosophies developed by societies with long histories of interaction with their natural surroundings. And elsewhere, it states that traditional knowledge tends to be collectively owned and takes the form of stories, songs, folklore, proverbs, uh, cultural values, beliefs, rituals, uh, customary law, and, and uh, LAWS and LORES, uh, local languages, and agricultural practices. Um, and, and that's important from the UNESCO uh, perspective, but for us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we refer uh, pretty much to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that was... Uh, uh, supported by the Human Rights Council in 2007. And, you know, a key element to all of the declaration is about 
self-determination and about us as Indigenous peoples being able to express who we are and, and to be able to uh, express and share our, our knowledges and, and histories and so forth. But specifically when we talk about traditional knowledges, um, I think there's a couple of specific articles that are important. Articles 25 and 26 uh, refer to the rights to country. We have rights to country uh, that we as traditional owners occupied and otherwise used or acquired. And these include the rights to maintain and strengthen our spiritual relationship to country, rights to uphold our responsibilities to our future generations, rights to control, own, develop and use our country uh, uh, and, and the country that we possess and other rights to country. And that including uh, the, including the important one that we are custodians of the country. We're not owners of a country um, and that it is a collective ownership. And when you look at Article 31, it specifically refers to cultural heritage and traditional knowledge. We have the right to maintain, control, protect and develop our cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, sciences and technologies. These include resources like human materials or seeds and medicines, knowledge of plants and animals, oral traditions, literature, designs, traditional sports and visual and performing arts and sacred sites and cultural artifacts. And what's important, it goes on to say that the government should work with us to develop measures that ensure these rights are recognised and protected. And, and for us as, as Indigenous Australians, uh, this is paramount to our existence and, and our past existence. So look, let me kick it off uh, by firstly uh, uh, asking Brad, what, what does Indigenous knowledges mean to you? And how can the STEM sector benefit from this knowledge, or these knowledges, I should say? Yeah, well, thanks, Tom. That's a, and that, that was a good segue straight from um, United Nations Declaration because it's that's an important document that we need to use more and obviously re refer to more. And because I suppose Indigenous knowledges, to me, is every single Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nation on this country have a connection, understanding of their respective countries. And, you know, whether that's desert, uh, alpine region, not far from he us here in Canberra, um, out, um, temperate regions and the tropics, you know. So there's, we, we go across all these, I suppose, um, bio regions. And I suppose that, that connection and understanding is linked to that thousands of generations of observation, singing, dancing, and knowing their country. And that's built in to a lot of Aboriginal people of, of knowing and the, the ways of knowing and being. So, you know, those stories, those songs, those dances are told and retold. And that is in Indigenous knowledge and that is evidence to me. And I suppose what can the STEM industry, you know, is that come and sit at our fires and listen. You know, that's why you've got two, e two ears and one mouth is listen double, double to your talking. And I suppose that knowledge that we talk about, you know, goes way back before science was even a thing. You know, we go back thousands of generations and, you know, that, and only, we're only recent in the last probably 20 years, we're seeing evidence of our knowledge being validated by a Western system, you know, but we need to culturally validate it. You know, we need to make sure that we give the okay that our knowledge is being protected and approved and, and endorsed by our by our old people and you know we've we've got so many areas where we can actually influence you know climate change i'm in the water space the climate change issues um astronomy we're seeing some good stuff fire ecology um even even stories about volcanic activity you know like one of the potentially one of the oldest ones on the planet is is Budge Bim in Western Victoria, you know, 37,000 years that story has survived. So, you know, that, that stuff's exciting, but I think the STEM industry needs to adapt and change to meet, mm. you know, new, new science for an old, old science. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely so. And, and when you, you think that we as a, as a peoples have survived for 65, 85,000 years in this country, so we've We've seen it all, um, you know, and, and uh, multiple uh, climate change impacts, as well as as being able to care for the country. And and the, the other reference is is to seas, and you mentioned waters, but the, the seas, the oceans, 
and uh, mm. and we look at our our brothers and sisters, uh, you know, in the Torres Straits or Tasmania, where mm. all all different ecologies that that uh, you know we have to cope with. Uh, yeah, and so from from your perspective, what are what are the um, I guess perspectives or mis misconceptions that might exist within STEM um, when it comes to understanding Indigenous knowledges? Yeah, look, this this happened on on day one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 1788 uh, you know what's happened is we've seen that you know our our way of caring for country and telling and retelling stories that have survived you know climate change and and volcanic activity as I mentioned before you know those stories are, are that observation and mm-hmm. when uh, science sees our stories it puts it into the realm of fiction so make-believe fable myth and legend mumbo jumbo so we get tagged with all those those and that pushes pushes us from the realm of science and evidence to actually the realm of fiction so you know i think our as i said earlier that our science and our observation and our testing of country and understanding country has survived you know we're still here you know we've even mm. survived policy that's how good we are mm-hmm. um and i suppose you know that's the way the, the settler put us in that realm to actually diminish our ancient knowledge. Mm. Yeah, very much so. And, and even in, in more contemporary times. And, and I think, you know, uh, books like, uh, you know, recently published, um, uh, authored by Bruce Pascoe and Dark Emu, which talks about those, you know, agricultural sciences and, and mm. practices that existed, pre-colonisation and then intercolonisation, and and going and looking at some factual reports around you know, what the colonisers uh, reported on and what they saw. And, you know, in Canberra here, we, we, uh, there's a lot written about how we maintain the country through fire mm. stick farming and, and uh, looked after the land and, and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a, good, um, a good area that all scientists need to, to, um, to spend some time and, and understand that there's, you know, there's a discipline of science, but there's also a traditional knowledge of science and practice that we've um, we've been able to to uh, survive with over all these years. Vanessa, as a, as a, an emerging scientist, um, could you share maybe some of your experiences with indigenous knowledges uh, within your area of research and the sector? And and good on you for that video too. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, the area I'm in, there isn't too much First Nations knowledge which can be applied. You know, I'm dealing with um, a sector which involves an introduced livestock species, um, which really shouldn't be in Australia, and they're creating havoc on the environment. Um, But as far as my research goes, um, I'm doing a high-end biotech studies to protect these animals um, in the intensive southern um, farming systems from parasites. So I'm not really using First Nations knowledge, but I'm using my passion for animals, which is a First Nations attribute um, to, you know, protect these animals um, as we move towards a more intensive farming practices, which is, um, it's unavoidable in these, mm. in these times. So um, basically, I guess I'm, you know, a First Nations woman excelling in a white Western science um, and I'm bringing my First Nations passion for animals into it. As well as you know everything else. Yeah, yeah. And whilst you might not have been able to do it, you know, one of our our real pioneers and and science innovators was David Unipan, who who um, uh, developed all the technology around the uh, uh, the shears um, for shearing sheep. And and he's on our fifty dollar note for those that uh, don't know David. But uh, you know, he had all the patterns and came to that sort of technology uh, long before. Well, it's actually revolutionised, um, you know, the, the sheep and livestock industry uh, around the world. Um, so, yeah. yep, you've got a chance it's of changing. doing that in the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, Susan, over to you now. Um, you've established research collaborations and knowledge centres with both urban and, and remote Indigenous communities. And these include things like elders and rangers using drones and artificial intelligence technologies to tap into their traditional knowledges. Uh, can you share with us uh, a little bit about these projects and some of the positive outcomes 
and solutions that uh, may have flowed from them or potentially will flow from them into the future. Thank you, Tom. Yamagara, Nadu Nimba, Walwen, Mayi, Nangunda, Nuramba, Nimba, Walwen, Nura, Nimba, Walwen, Dagun. I've just said hello uh, with respect. Um, I'm a Nimba, Walwen person, my country, my home, my Nimba, Walwen land. I come from a town in far northwest remote. Um, or very remote, it's considered by AB, uh, the ABS stats um, and the Australian government as um, very remote Australia. It's a town called Brewarana and it's on the Murray Darling River system. And we have what we think is the oldest living man made structure, uh, oldest man made structure in the world, which is an engineering feat. Um, it's what we call Bayamis Nunu. So I've known from a very early age, my dad used to bring fish from, from the fish traps there um, to home for, for breakfast when we were um, living uh, in the town. Um, previous to that, we actually lived on the river. But um, for our cultural knowledges, for me, is, is about... Um, about knowledge sovereignty. And it's absolutely critical that we as Aboriginal people start to recognise um, our individual, our kinship and our community knowledges. And what we've started to do is to identify or design anyway, we haven't actually reached the actual stages of building these, but we're, we're calling them cultural hubs. And they're what, what non-Aboriginal people would call um, data centres but we would call them knowledge centres or um, what we've decided to call them in um, Nimba um, at home and um, also with um, Baladong Wajak Nungas in um, urban Perth, um, cultural hubs. And so um, we've decided um, that it's, it's critical to bring these cultural knowledges, science and technology together and connect those with our communities. So Animba Countryman said to me once, we know nothing about our health, our community health, our cultural health and the health of our rivers. The government has it all. And that's true. All our knowledges have been excavated and mined as by anthropologists and archeologists for centuries now. And we continue to do that through government departments, universities and organisations um, where it's stored, who knows where, potentially unsafe data centres overseas and in Australia. It's interpreted third hand without context and attributed to the collectors. And in technology, we're replicating and perpetuating the same, what we call epistemological erasure. So our Aboriginal ways of knowing doing and being are not necessarily represented appropriately or properly in the context of the knowledges or the data that is interpreted by non-Aboriginal people and published by non-Aboriginal people. And I believe if we can build a NASA rocket launch station on country in the Northern Territory, we can build culture hubs, cultural hubs too. Yeah. And these cultural hubs, what they do is they connect mob <coughs> country and culture closer to the technology and the sciences. You can't become what you don't see, right? So that's what the idea is all about. And the drones and body cameras, when elders teach their intimate knowledge of the biodiversity from the macro environments of our waters and our lands and skies to the microorganisms, right down to the nanomolecular structures that's what we, we're teaching our youth and, um, and adults who go out on country or via live feed with, um, if elders are relocated from country. We use Aboriginal kinship protocols to protect individual and kin related, then community related Indigenous cultural intellectual property, which is what Tom was talking about in the introduction. And then we bring cultural integrity and cultural validity to artificial intelligence by listening, sharing, doing, reflecting through design and with all of community according to whom the knowledges belong. 
So they might be individual, um, where individuals can also store in the cultural hub. They can store their knowledges, photos, videos of cultural dance or artifacts like um, message sticks where they then connect to an entrepreneurial platform and they can market and sell their stored knowledges. But the big thing here is that we're bringing um, where everybody is um, storing these knowledges, we've able to, we are able to access them, interpret them, consider them by elders and community and in relation to local, national and international innovation and solutions. So we can build partnerships with you, with whoever um, we choose and report on those with what we want to, to report on. And also at a fair and reasonable cost, we can provide that information to the universities, the organisations and the governments. But, but this ensures that our Indigenous cultural intellectual property is maintained by the communities. So there's, you know, there's work around um, governance structures, but if you actually think about, um, if, if you actually think about um, Colin Saltmere's um, Spinifex project up in um, Camerwheel, his mob uh, have implemented a governance structure where all of the funds that they get from the project and if you don't know anything about the Spinifex project, it's primarily something my dad said to me, oh, yeah, we used to um, whack the Spinifex and um, out comes the, the sap resin. and um, we, the resin and we would um, use that to glue our, our tools together, um, you know, fix the tools or do whatever it was they needed. So it's those knowledges that Colin has been able to um, protect and... Um, and now we've been able to, he's been able to apply that to innovative um, solutions or not solutions, but uh, um, uses such as um, they're looking at the nano um, molecular um, component so that they can actually use it as Botox fillers for people who use Botox. So there's so many ways that we as Aboriginal people need to be thinking about our knowledges. And what we're asking is, you know, if we turn the lens on the government sending out lots of people to our communities and consider um, rather than you know holding our knowledges elsewhere storing our knowledges in our communities keeping it close to our people so that our people can actually see the technology be involved in the technology we can determine the partnerships and we can you know really go forward um, with outcomes that actually see, we actually get to make decisions based on fully informed, self-determined community choice. Yep, and that, that's, that's so critical and where we go. You know, I've often referred to the, to the um, you know, willful blindness that, that mainstream society has had to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and our knowledges and cultures. And, and you know, you mentioned the Brewarana fish traps down there. And the other good examples are the eel traps and, and storage areas down in Victoria. Um, and, you know, it's through the using the adaption of modern technologies to be able to, to uh, record and, and actually uh, see them, uh, which is living proof as to what they, uh, you know, what they were used for. And slowly there's, uh, you know, there's, there's recognition, um, but, uh, you know, there's still some way to go. And, and we should not forget that it was, you know, um, back in, in, in the early 90s that, and we've just celebrated this Mabo Day, when uh, Koikieri Mabo up on the island of Mur in the Torres Straits uh, referred to all of their fish traps and the way that they divided lands. Fish traps that, that no one ever recognised until, until it became obvious and you started to take a few photographs and through that clear water you could see it. So, so you know, it's that, that legitimising our knowledges uh, that is that is starting a journey. But, um, you know, it's so important that, that we all um, and, and all of our, our um, you know, fellow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but also our non-Indigenous uh, uh, fellows and members, uh, see how they can uh, expand their knowledge and work with us uh, to get these. And, and maybe uh, an example of that, Brad, is, uh, you know, you recently co-authored uh, the publication Indigenous Research Methodologies in Water Management, learning from Australia and New Zealand 
for application of Camilleroy country in wetland ecology management. Um, so maybe can you tell us a little bit about that and what inspired you and, and is there anything that um, is similar in New Zealand? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yeah, look, really, it's sort of, it's a good follow on from Susan's discussion then because it's, you know, I got, why I, did, I started a PhD was I got tired of, you know, other people telling our stories, tired of being the researched, you know, I thought it, it was time to become the researcher, you know, flip that whole paradigm and do it, do it my way. And, you know, obviously the aim was to do it, um, by Camilleroy, for Camilleroy, on Camilleroy country, you know. So that was the aim of the paper. And it, it comes as number five as part of my PhD journey. So it's, it's, I'm going through the peer reviewed uh, publication process for my PhD. So it'll be number five. I've just got number six. Um, and that, that hopefully that'll be it. <laughs> and um, so my research was looking at how traditional knowledge can actually influence Western water management. Because when we look at the way Western water management principles and, and methodologies over the last 234 years, um, we see a sad tale of mismanagement, over extraction, diversion, pollution, and, and sadly, greed, because water has a dollar value in our river systems mm. and our groundwater systems. So, you know, from my point of view, water needs to be valued as the essence of life. And I don't know if you know, but without it, you die. So it's pretty important. Mm. <laughs> and, so, and so, and you know what? And my research for this paper um, was was uh, supported by the award um, back in 2019, and I got to travel to Aotearoa and um, spend time with a number of tribes on both islands, north and south. Um, so it was with the Naitahu in the south, and the two northern ones where I had connections were um, Wakato Tainui and also Te Arawa at Rotorua. So you know, I was listening to them. My my travel award funded me to, to go and listen and you know as i said earlier you know you get two ears and one mouth so i was purely there to listen and learn um, on the way they actually influence and how they change you know especially around language but also their right um, you know they've got similar challenges to us and you know finding out how their their methodologies are influenced especially through language and also they, they, they're fantastic singers. So whenever you go to the Marais, you know, they sing you in, you know, oh, it's magnificent. And uh, yeah, I've got a terrible voice. So I'm like a bag of cats being swung around. So no way I could, I could, I could sing, <laughs> sing people into my country. But, you know, I think there's, they do have a, um, they're in a better position because they have a treaty. Uh, the Treaty of Waitangi, you know, we, you know, Victoria's talking treaty now and, you know, I think it passed the lower house down there and, you know, so that, that's fantastic and you know, I think there's, there's a broader national discussion that I think may emerge in the next couple of years, which, which would be great to see. So learning from Māori people was fantastic, you know, and, you know, I, I was at a Waikato Tainui River Festival and they actually had some um, North American First Nations um, present um, from the Cree Nation and Helsuk. Um, and I asked one of the, the lads, the, the, the deputy grand chief of the Cree Nation, how do, how do you make sure that you are um, a part of this? And he just sort of, he said, well, the easiest way is act like you own it. I said, oh, how do I do that? Maybe you know, we only know how to drive like you stole it. Um, but <laughs> I think there's, you know, there's there's opportunities for learning. You know, I think if we act and and be and you know, it's entering that space and it, it's sort of fitting for you know this get up, stand up, show up is, is us. You know, like we're here on on these screens and beaming out to to an audience because we've shown up and and every day we get up and you know sometimes you're tired and and then I think just imagine how tired my elders are. So I got to get up. And I got to stand up, and I got to show up. Yeah, Thanks, thank Tom. you, thank you, Brad. And uh, yeah, Treaty of Waitangi, eighteen forty, um, we had our our first recognition as uh, to be counted in the census, nineteen sixty seven. They were a tad behind, uh, you mm -hmm. know, getting those those sort of rights. But you know, you're correct in saying that treaty discussions uh, are progressing at a reasonable pace across the nation uh, in Australia here. And so we will see that that's starting to ramp up 
particularly at the state and territory uh, level, a uh, national level is probably going to be a little bit more, more challenging um, in, in what we do. And, and just uh, in case people weren't aware, the award you were referring to was an award you received from the Academy. Mm. That, that's correct? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that's another, yeah. another shout out, and, and, uh, and I'm sure Vanessa will do this in a second. Um, but to all of our, our, um, our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who might be participating, that you, know, you, you get these opportunities if you stand up and, and, uh, and shout out. Uh, you know, and so get in the running uh, if you want to get one of these awards. But I think that's a good segue. Um, uh, or maybe, no, I'll go to Susan. Um, Susan, because you've, um, you've established the National Indigenous STEM Professional Network, and, um, and this is all about how, how the network is to uh, support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers and scientists. And so uh, maybe can you just explore that a little bit with us and, and uh, tell us how we can get involved? Yeah, well, we like to use the word, um, or well, the words, facilitate the success rather than support um, Aboriginal mm -hmm. and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and yep. our network, Bradley um, and Vanessa, are both a part of that, um, where we, we, we were established um, to form a critical mass of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander STEM professionals, academics and students. And the objectives are to collaborate, mentor and share across all of those three roles, professionals, academics and, and um, students. So we had two online gatherings where we collectively define the network's purpose and objectives. And we're having an inaugural face-to-face -face gathering, which is scheduled for the 6th to the 9th of November this year. And we're actually looking for sponsors. So, um, if, or ally partners to cover the cost of all of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, STEM attendees um, and the running of the event. Um, we're also looking for financial and administrative contributions. So I'm doing a big plug here to set up the network. Um, mm. For example, we're commissioning an artist to help us with our um, communication logo and advancement materials. So if anybody wants to, um, you know, um, contact us, please do so. You can contact us via the Australian Academy of Science or, or um, we, I think we've posted a, um, a LinkedIn page or um, contact Brad or myself or Vanessa. Um, but uh, the, the purpose is, as I said, to um, collaborate and we're looking at, you know, research, we're looking at um, mentoring for um, students, for academics and for professionals. And um, yeah, it's to, to bring that collaborative or that um, critical mass in order for us to um, start to discuss the potential of what it means as a, a group, a, a national group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander STEM um, practising mm. professionals, academics and students. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the hallmarks of, of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We, we're... we're we're willing to share and to work mm. together to achieve this. We're not in, in competition, even though we might be, you know, competitive, going for competitive grants and so forth. We're, we're always there to, uh, to work together. So did you, in, in your um, uh, getting to your, your uh, uh, current status, uh, have you had mentors and, and sort of what sort of role have they played and, and what can you tell us about mentors and support and why they're important to have? Well, aside from my dad, who instilled in me to look, listen, think, and to think deeply um, and to question everything, which I say has, has only truly um, begun to crystallise in my latter years, professionally, um, as a, I had a non-Aboriginal engineer um, who had confidence in me and his collegiality elevated my abilities, which led me to study. Um, I didn't go to study. Um, and I was pretty much self-taught um, in um, networking, as in um, computer networks and um, programming until, and database design and development until um, my 40s, um, I went to university. So, and then um, academically, it's been both black academics or um, 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, well, Aboriginal um, academics, and a P, uh, one of my PhD, um, sorry, well, yes, PhD PNG, um, Papua New Guinean supervisors. Um, they've all created an open space for connections and opportunities for me. And um, the women in particular um, created not only the connections, but provided the academic rigour and reinvigorated my innate skills to track back, I know Aileen Morton Robinson, you know, track mm. back everything that Western systems and authors use to oppress us. And then I have to, I have to put a, a shout out to Professor Bronwyn Fredericks, who transformed my Aboriginal values in, you know, in academic, um, in the academic space, because her humility, generosity and collegiality is second to none. But she enlivened my dad's lessons to always show up be persistent and work hard. So, and, and now I'm only just beginning to meet non-Aboriginal academics whom I, I wouldn't say are mentors just yet, but they have the potential um, to maybe create space, step aside while remaining by my side. And really that's um, what I'm looking for um, is, for the opportunities and it's really been the Aboriginal men and women who've done that um, for me um, so in the past. So mm. I'm hoping that more non-Aboriginal people are able to create that space for, for more of us and us as Aboriginal um, STEM computer scientists, scientists um, and engineers and mathematicians. Mm. And Brad, have you, did, did you have a, a mentor? Do you have a mentor? Um... And how have you found it? Oh, I, when you look at Indigenous scientists, no, yeah. no. As a, um, oh, you might have to become my mentor now because you're a fellow of the Academy of Science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I think growing up, it was just my, my love of science and my persistence that kept me going and, and in this space, but it's, you know, you have people along the way, you know, your uncles and aunties and the, the drive and obviously your grandparents, you know, all the sacrifices they made, you know, they just sort of drive you to, to actually do better, you know, have that impact, you know, and not not sit down and dwell upon your misfortune all the time. You know, they were so humble and, you know, you, Susan, you talked about, you know, Bronwyn's humility, you know, old, you know you, when you think about the old people, their humility was unbelievable. Yeah, they didn't talk about those times when they were locked up on missions and reserves as bad times. They had fun. They made their own fun. But man, I, just just to think, like if our Wi-Fi goes down, all hell breaks loose. You know, they 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 had they had real life challenges. What every bit of their life was controlled. You know, so it's they they're the ones that inspire me. Yeah, they're my yeah. heroes. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And and uh, Vanessa, yourself, do you have a a mentor? Have you had mentors? Uh... Um, uh, I don't, not really. Well, I guess my drive for doing what I do was, you know, obviously like Brad, my family and everyone supporting me. Um, definitely proving a lot of people wrong that I could, you know, do what I'm doing. That was a huge drive for me. Um, and the reason why I do a lot of the things that I, I do now. Um, also, I guess just with university and with my PhD studies was just mainly, you know, finding the people who were in my corner and backing me and encouraging yeah. me and making sure that they're the people that I talk to and I associate myself with. So that's a really, that's a really, really, um, the, one of the really thing, the only things that have gotten me through it is finding the people who, yeah, stand in my corner. Back. Yeah, within within the discipline, and and there's, you know, I think that's that's a great, a great, um, you know, story because I think there's plenty of opportunities within within the academy. We've got some phenomenal people here who who um, who can be mentors, and you know, something that we need to to maybe think a little bit more about is how how we can encourage some of our um, uh, non-indigenous scientists, um, you know, to to help help guide us into the future and. And, um, you know, and I think that's, that's mainly it. It's not about telling us what to do. It's just to be there to mm -hmm. be able to, to uh, provide whatever level of, of um, encouragement uh, that we need uh, to get through, and particularly on the disciplines. So let me ask you a, an easier question. 
now, Vanessa, because uh, but this is, uh, I think you've partly answered this, but we'll, we'll do it anyhow. Um, so within your area of uh, biotechnology and molecular biology and uh, parasitology, are there examples of embedded indigenous knowledge systems? And, uh, but the important bit of that, uh, because you, I think you said that there wasn't a great deal, how do we change it? Um, yeah. What can we do? Yeah, so, you know, in molecular biology and biotechnology, you can't really embed First, Nation, First Nations knowledge into it because um, it doesn't matter who you are as far as DNA goes, A binds to T and C binds to G. You know, um, at a molecular level, we're all the same. Um, I guess my big thing is um, breaking, you know, the traditional way of, of doing it. And um, I guess I could be an example of a First Nations person getting up um, and being involved in a white Western science, um, standing up by excelling in it re and excelling in it and um, competing with everyone else in the discipline. Um, and then obviously speaking up by encouraging other First Nations people that they can be successful and be involved in a white Western science domain. Um, yeah. You know, it doesn't mean that it's got no um, Indigenous knowledge in it. You always have that with you, no matter what you're doing. Um, it's just hard to apply it to yeah. molecular biology. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that that's right. And, uh, and you know, what, what you described is, is becoming a role model yourself and a mentor and, and like, like, you know, all of us getting out and, and speaking and encouraging younger people to think about, you know, the sciences as a profession. And it, and, and it really does start not at high school or, or university, but way back in, in primary school so we can get the foundations uh, develop, but but seeing, you know, and and seeing that encouragement that that we can do it, and that that you know, you're all you're all pioneers in this, you know, pathfinders in breaking breaking down some of those barriers, um, you know, and so it, I think it bodes really well, uh, you know, for the future. Now we're getting close to when when I'm going to invite the audience to to ask questions, um, so I just a, a little warning, folks who are on watching us online, that uh, we're very keen to take questions from you. Uh, but before we do, and while you're thinking about what question you want to ask, um, Susan, uh, what changes would you like to see in the collection and publication of Indigenous knowledges and, and data? And um, is it going to provide you know, the best outcomes for advancing uh, Indigenous communities? Um, this is such an important question and mm. um, I'd like to reframe it um, because I don't think it's about collecting. I think it's about facilitating Aboriginal peoples to collect, store, consider and apply the knowledges through partnerships that they choose. So, you know, if... If, but, if, but if, for example, people are collecting our knowledges, then we need to make sure that it, the knowledges are attributed to our cultural knowledge keepers and that they're appropriately um, remunerated. We have mm. to think about the years of, um, of knowledge, the, the, the centuries, the since millennia we're talking, we know that, you know, it's um, Western science has proven at least 67,500 years and now there's evidence of 85,000 years. We know from our stories that it's way beyond that, our mm. song lines. So we have to think about the value of the knowledges that, that some of our, our cultural knowledges, our cultural knowledge keepers hold. And we have to think about, um, for example, if you think about Victor Stephenson's elders who received their um, doctorates alongside a non-Indigenous woman who got her PhD using the knowledges on the mosaic burning or fire stick burning, mm. that was truly a reciprocal relationship. Um, and we know that Indigenous knowledges have a very real, practical, beneficial and valuable um, innovative applications and that's why the governments are sending out so many government departments are sending out or deploying <laughs> employing so many average people and dispersing them right across the lands to continue to excavate and mine 
I'd say stop it. Show mm. some reciprocity. It's time to teach or provide opportunities for us to lead our way. And this is either in partnership with you or not, but we need to see, to see attribution, appropriate remuneration and true partnerships. Mm. And, and I think also to recognise that just because we're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander doesn't mean we know everything about everything that goes on in Indigenous affairs. We can contribute and, and many of us are happy to contribute, but I think the, the, you know, the issue that you raised about uh, the recognition through, through um, you know, uh, some sort of support is important. And, and even if that support is by way of contributing to the network, um, you know, if you've already bought some tiles, folks, uh, for the Shine Dome, um, now it's a chance to, to invest in, in another foundational program uh, through the network. So look, I will, I will now um, uh, go on to questions because we do have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Paul Richards, who you see on your screen, our Director of Communications and Outreach, will, will actually uh, read out the questions so we all know what it is and then I'll direct it to, to one of our panel members. Over to you, Paul. Terrific. Thanks so much, Tom. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so the first question that we've got uh, for the panel, Tom, is from Kieran Shirey, who is on Baganjin on Turbul Country. And uh, Kieran writes, firstly, happy NADOC week, you deadly mob. Uh, we recently launched the in first Indigenous designed and developed software for business to manage their reconciliation journeys. We're already seeing more data than I believe has ever been collectively stored about the contributions corporate Australia is making towards creating positive social impact for our mob. How important do you think it is for Indigenous people to have the ability to manage the narrative, which is often manipulated against our people's best interests when in the hands of government funded or even tertiary institutions? Yeah, very important question. I might ask Susan to respond to that. Um, uh, please, Susan, what do you think? Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Then thank you for the question, Kieran. I think it's really important that um, Aboriginal people manage the, the narrative. Um, it's uh, Professor Maggie um, Walter from um, University of Tasmania, um, a Palawa woman. She um, talked about Narakati. She does Narakati, uh, uh, an Aboriginal methodology called um, Narakati, and it means good numbers. And it's about how we actually um, how we look at the data, she's a st statistician. She said nobody, um, you know, at the time, nobody was allowed to view, um, no Aboriginal people were meant to look at um, statistics because statistics have been used against us for so many decades. Um, but it was actually not about um, the, the data. It, well, partly it was but it was mostly about the questions that were being asked of the data. So for us to be able to um, determine what is collected and then to view it in the way that we need to view it um, in the context in which we know that knowledge is represented um, is the right thing to do. And um, then we don't see deficit thinking where we're always placed in this really, um, you know, like I like to think of Aboriginal people. My father was a very intelligent man. He had to teach himself to, to read. He never um, completed his schooling. In fact, he left around the same time that you had to have a clean, clad and courteous certificate. Um, and he had to go in the bush and um, work. And his first job was to look after the horses for his brothers who were fencing. Um, and, you know, like they're the sort of... But yet he learned to do maths... Um, and he could sum up quicker than I could add them into a calculator at the time when he was teaching me and showing me to do my homework at the kitchen table at midnight. Um, mm. So, you know, that's, we have the ability to do these things. There's no question. We need to think of, so stop looking at us as the problem um, and think about us as excellence. And the only way um, we're going to truly do that is if we manage the narrative and we um, direct how the data is to be displayed and the knowledge is. Mm. Yeah, and, uh, and, and thank you again, Kieran. 
Maggie's doing great work. So is uh, Professor Marcia Langton, who's looking yeah. at the whole question on, on data sovereignty and how we access data uh, to address many of the questions. Because whilst the data is in the hands of other people, we are disempowered. And, and uh, you know, some of the areas that I work in, in, in genomics uh, and cancers, and we have these global registers and, and national registers where all of our data goes in, but we don't access it and we, we aren't able to, to utilise it um, in a way that's going to improve our, our well-being. So, yeah, good, good question and good on you, Kieran. So, Paul, I believe we have some more questions. Yeah, they're coming flooding in uh, now, Ooh. Tom. So I've, the next one is from Jesse Oliver, who's watching from Turbul and Jagira country. Uh, and Jesse says, first, thank you so much for sharing your respective knowledges and experiences. As a person of non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent, with little agency as a PhD student myself, I'd value listening to how I might be able to facilitate success for endeavours discussed authentically and respectfully. Yeah, look, um, thanks. And I think that's, uh, again, another important one. Um, Vanessa, you're almost through. Did you want to have a, a quick response to that? What was the question again? Sorry. Uh, so the question. Oh, no, well, yes, it's <laughs> basically coming in again from um, from Brisbane, and um, and it's just that how how does um, uh, Jessie get involved in in um, uh, you know because she's coming she's a doctoral student herself and um, and a non-indigenous person so and I should say that uh, straight is not spelled correctly there. A different straight, um, and and uh, uh, and she she's valued what she's heard, but um, you know so how 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 might she be able to facilitate success for in for in uh, in, in endeavouring um, or enduring discussions uh, that are authentic and and respectful? So so how do, how does she get more involved in understanding about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people? Oh, now? I and the, our knowledges and all that. Um, yeah. I think there's there's heaps of ways, you know. Um, I think we're all happy to talk about it. If you know an Indigenous person, you can sit down with them and respectfully ask them about, about it. I think we're, you know, I like passing on my knowledge about my culture and my family and all that sort of stuff. Um, if you're at a university that's got an Aboriginal centre, like UNE has Orala Aboriginal Centre, they are wonderful for that sort of stuff. They've got events all the time. Um, you know, you mm. can attend all of those things. You don't have to be Indigenous to go to them. Um, again, we like to spread our knowledge and to teach everyone about our culture. Um, you can go even to, you know, your local um, keeping place or Indigenous centre in town. There is so many places that you can go um, to learn about um, our culture um, so then yeah. you know you're a bit more aware of it because I think for a while obviously it was kept you know to ourselves so um, a lot of you know non-Indigenous people don't have much of an idea about about it all so I think yeah that's that's actually mm. really amazing that you'd ask that question I think that's fabulous yeah um, but we're happy to talk about it. Uh, it it is and and you're asking it the right week NADOC week um, you know, where, where there is so much out there and just watching uh, NITV or ABC almost every night, there's a fantastic story. And for those that didn't catch it last night, uh, there's one called Blaze and it was all about uh, uh, William Onus and, and his, his fight for rights and justice. Um, uh, a great program. I'd encourage everybody to go and, and um, you know, look at iView and... and, and um, and uh, take that down. So Paul, another quick question. Sure, uh, this time from uh, Ben, who's on Ngunnawal country. Uh, ben says, how can we best become aware and build indigenous science and knowledge principles into science for all to inform decisions by a range of land managers? Yeah, well, that's definitely yours, Brad. Um... <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, look, I think it, and you're right, it has to start, I think you mentioned before, Tom, that it, it has to start at preschool and go all the way to university. Mm. So, you know, indigenising the curricula is seems to be happening. You know, there's a few few resources out there and there's some goodwill out there to, to try and make sure that that influences um, what is taught. And I think, you know, sometimes teachers 
believe that, that you know they don't have the right or they they're not comfortable in teaching aboriginal knowledge um but i think there's there's plenty of resources out there now that um where you can actually develop lesson plans from from for most grades and also at university level there's some really cool stuff happening at um i think uq and then um the indigenous knowledges um center down in, in university of melbourne um university of wollongong that they're actually indigenising curricula. So, and you see, we're on a path right now yes. where we're actually looking at how we can do it better. And but I think there's, there's the opportunity will build from developing the resources, but then you actually need to bring in the knowledge. So, you know, having elders come in with scientists, you know, and they're equals. Then, then you know, and they're coming to talk together about you know how the two two knowledge systems can actually work together for for better solutions. And I think. You know we can we can do that much better um and you know that that is that is sometimes stepping outside your comfort zone to to go and have a cup of tea with at the land council or a, the native title prescribed body corporate or or whatever you know just just starting that conversation and you know then then you get the opportunity and i think the best way to learn indigenous knowledge is actually sitting out on country um yeah. outdoor classrooms are one of the better ways to do it yeah Thanks. Uh, Susan, yeah. Yeah, can I just add to that? That's great response, Brad. Um, what I think is really important, though, uh, when you do ask cultural knowledge keepers to come um, and contribute, um, you need to make it not an add-on at the end. If you're actually going to embed something into curriculum, it means embed it and make it examinable make it part of the assignment that you're doing, make it, um, you know, consider that knowledge that's shared um, and truly um, help people to understand that knowledge that was shared. And of course, pay people appropriately. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, just a, uh, a plug for uh, Reconciliation Australia, if you go to their website and have a look at the Narragunawali program, uh, that's uh, directed towards uh, preschools and, and primary schools, and, and there's Indigenous curriculum across the whole lot from an Indigenous perspective, uh, which, is, which is so important. Uh, we've got over 9,000 schools and early childhood centres who are signed, signed up on RAPS. So it's, it's happening at that, that schooling level. Um, but yeah, look, even, even the academy, um, you know, I think into the, into the future, we'll, we'll be able to contribute to much more on the curriculum side of it. Especially as people re realise that, you know, it's not a competitive environment. It should be a cooperative, you know, learning environment for all of us. We're all better people for it. Because, you know, the thing that we've got to recognise is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the longest continuing surviving cultures in the world. Um, you know, so we, we got there uh, because of all of our, our knowledges. Um, yeah, OK. So we're almost at the end. Paul, was there any last... Question that you thought? Well, it's hard to pick. There are a few more uh, terrific ones left, but I will ask one here from one of our uh, fellows who's tuned in, Liz, Lynn Beasley, uh, who is on yes. Noongar Country. Uh, Professor Beasley says, wonderful discussion, thank you. How can we better incorporate Aboriginal knowledge and understanding in STEM, uh, in teaching in our schools in particular? Yes, well, that's really a follow on from, from that uh, uh, previous question, but. Um, I, might, I might just uh, ask Vanessa to give a bit of a reflection on, on sort of what, what, what put you on your path. Was it something that happened at school and, and uh, in, in uh, recognising, uh, you know, Lynn's question, Professor Lynn's? Yeah. Um, well, no, not really. I didn't, this isn't like really where I thought I would end up. I've always loved science. Um, I never thought I'd be doing a PhD though, you know. But like I said earlier, it was just, you know, a little bit of um, encouragement from everyone and to prove everyone wrong. But I think, you know, it's really important with the STEM, in the STEM sector to um, get to the kids early and, um, and make it look, you know, good. Like we do at the university now, we do a lot of stuff with, um, it was first year 11 and 12s, and now we've decided we're going to start doing it with the younger 
younger years because when you're in year 11 and 12 you've kind of made up your mind with what you're going to do so you know it's i think it's really important to focus um you know obviously on the older kids but really on the younger kids to get them um into stem and to encourage them into it yeah and uh sue yeah Oh, just a quick one. I remember um, back in 2012, I took um, a heap of XO laptops out to um, Brew Warner and um, we just, uh, you know, developed a, a community um, program, community run that was independent of the school. And what we did was we developed something around um, self, self-respect, community, who's your mob and your country. And um, we had elders and the children turn up to a cultural site, so the fish traps or the mission or Red Hill. And um, we had the elders tell stories. So this is a bit like having, you know, an elder come into the classroom um, and tell stories. The children were not only learning about, for example, the fish traps and how we use the fish traps. They were using the laptops to measure the sound between the two laptops, they had to understand the wind, the temperature, the humidity, um, to understand how sound travels. So there's a whole lot there that those children were learning with that program. Um, and, you know, that it might, it might not have been specifically um, some of the components, science, but there was a lot of science involved. And there was a lot of engineering involved in fish traps and measuring those fish traps. Mm. That's why, but they were measuring the distances between nets. So thanks, yeah. Tom. And, um, you know, I think Professor Beasley also, um, there's a responsibility for all uh, universities to get more involved, uh, particularly through our teaching programs, um, our education programs, our future teachers, to make sure that they get, um, you know, an understanding about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, affairs, peoples, how we can, can, you can pick any discipline. We've been involved in it at some, some part of it. And as Brad mentioned and, and others, there, there's a lot of work now happening at the universities to indigenise the curriculum. And, and um, you know, so I think the movement's starting, but, you know, you've got some great ambassadors um, around, you know, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And, and again, this week, um, you know, is the important week, uh, as, as as was Reconciliation Week that's just passed, as an opportunity to, to really learn. And and I can say that from my exposure, um, school kids from the primary and the secondary school are really keen um, to learn a lot more. And, you know, there's been recent surveys talking about uh, or asking people about, you know, do they want to know more about Aboriginal languages and Aboriginal people? Very positive. All the surveying we're doing for Reconciliation Australia is showing that as a nation, we're, we're maturing a lot more. We, we're, we're having a respect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. People are keen to understand more. They're keen to see us uh, uh, being given the opportunity to have a greater say in, in our own affairs. So, so look, I think the movement's starting. Uh, we've just got to keep it going. And, you know, as, as the theme, theme says, you know, um, uh, stand up, up, show, show up, stand up, and 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 uh, talk up and Get learn up. up. Yeah, so we've got to we've got to be able to uh, to really all work together on this one. Uh, but look, let me. We're really time time to close. We're a tad over. Very poor chairmanship. Sorry, emceeing. Um, so can I can I thank uh, Vanessa, Susan, and Brad uh, for for your contributions. They've been absolutely fantastic tonight and uh, really appreciate your candid, um, you know, sharing of your experiences and knowledges. And, and look, to the audience, thank you very much. You know, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions, but the ones we did get to were, um, were good. And it's good to see that it was fairly represented. We had a little crew from Brisbane, uh, one from down here in Canberra, another one from um, Perth. So, you know, we, we covered part of the nation. So look, uh, can I just thank everybody? And, and, and maybe just uh, hand back now to Helene to, to do a bit of a winding up and, and thank you. Over to you, Helene. Thank you, Tom, and all the panellists for your contributions. It was an excellent discussion and there were lots of takeaways from the evening. 
lots of food for thought. So thank you again. The Australian Academy of Science is committed to supporting excellence in science and empowering the next generation of scientists. This includes advancing reconciliation, creating opportunities to work respectfully with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, supporting their contributions to scientific activities and increasing understandings of Indigenous knowledge. You can learn more about our progress towards reconciliation on the Academy website. We look forward to recognising the research of more outstanding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander scientists, including PhD candidates and early and mid-career res researchers. Nominations for the 2024 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Scientist Award will open in early 2023. Videos on the work of Bradley and Vanessa as the recipients of our awards in 2019 and 2022 are available on our website and social media channels. This event has been recorded and is available on the Australian Academy of Science website right now. Thank you again to Tom, Bradley, Susan and Vanessa. And thank you to our audience for joining us this evening for this special NAIDOC Week event. Thanks everyone and good night. <laughs>